This video is sponsored by Skillshare. There's a link in the description for a free two-month premium membership. Hi, it's Michelle from Lab Muffin Beauty Science, Chemistry PhD, and Sunscreen Connoisseur. It's that time again, da -da -da -dum. SPF myth-busting time. Because no matter how hard I try, they keep turning up. I did a video on SPF myths last year, so check that out if you haven't already. If you like videos about the science behind beauty products, click the thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and click the notification bell so you don't miss any videos. Myth number one. Chemical sunscreens absorb UV, physical sunscreens scatter and reflect UV. I feel like I talk about this one a lot, but it won't die and I see a lot of really authoritative people repeat this myth on really large platforms, so here we go again. You've probably seen people say that physical sunscreens work like a barrier, they sit on top of skin like a shield, and they reflect or deflect or scatter UV rays. And then chemical sunscreens absorb UV and convert it to heat. In fact, both physical and chemical sunscreens, or more correctly, inorganic and organic sunscreens, mostly work by absorbing UV and converting it to heat. The real picture is more like this. Physical and chemical sunscreens both mostly absorb UV and convert it to heat, but physical sunscreens also scatter and reflect a tiny amount, about 10% of the incoming UV. But this is only 10%, so this isn't the reason why we use physical sunscreens as sunscreens. It's mostly because they can absorb UV and convert it to heat, just like with chemical sunscreens. Both of these sunscreens have electrons that can get excited to high energy levels with UV, so they absorb the UV in that step. Then when those electrons relax back down, they release that energy in different ways, mostly heat. The whole process is a bit technical, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but if you're interested, I can do a more technical, hardcore, nerdy video about it. Let me know in the comments if you want that. There's also an organic or chemical sunscreen that works a lot like zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Methylene bis benzo triazolal tetramethyl butyl phenol also known as Tinosorb M. It's an organic sunscreen, which means it's based on a carbon structure, and its structure looks a lot like other chemical sunscreens. But it doesn't dissolve in oil or water, and so that means you find it in sunscreens as a suspended particle. That means it also reflects and scatters some of the incoming UV, just like with zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, even though it has a much scarier name. But these are really darn close to organic sunscreens anyway, so it's not a really useful distinction to make. Once you realize that chemical and physical sunscreens work in pretty much the same way, then a lot of other myths about them start to unravel. So the myth that physical sunscreens are better for hyperpigmentation and melasma, this is based on the idea that heat makes melasma worse. But if you look at the difference in heat for physical and chemical sunscreens, it's only 10%, and so it doesn't make sense anymore. So this means the heat difference isn't a very good reason for choosing physical sunscreen over chemical sunscreen. Then why does your face feel hot under the sun when you're wearing sunscreen. The reason is the sun. The sunlight that reaches your skin is about 50% visible light, 40% infrared radiation, and 9% UV. So there's tons of heat around even without that tiny contribution from UV being converted to heat. The big problem with people picking physical sunscreens over chemical sunscreens for that heat reason is that chemical sunscreens are actually awesome for hyperpigmentation. Chemical sunscreens can give much higher UVA protection than physical sunscreens, especially if we're talking about the newer photostable UVA filters. All of the sunscreens with really high UVA protection use organic filters to get there. Chemical sunscreens also give less white cast, which is really important because people with hyperpigmentation tend to have darker skin. We are people of color. And the thing that people usually do to prevent this white cast is use less sunscreen, which is bad because then you have less protection, which leads to even more hyperpigmentation. I have another video comparing physical and chemical sunscreens. If you want more info, I'll put the link in the description. And if you want to learn more about legitimate reasons for picking one sunscreen over the other, then you can check out the Lab Muffin Guide to Basic Skincare. There is a free sample of my chapter on sunscreens, again linked in the description. Myth number two, a little goes a long way with sunscreens. I see this all the time in reviews. Sunscreens get a good review even though they're expensive because a little goes a long way. If you're a regular here, then you probably have the same reaction as me when you see that. Sunscreen is the worst product to skimp on. The protection you get with a sunscreen depends on how much you apply, and the relationship is pretty much linear. So if you apply two milligrams per square centimeter, you'll end up with the protection stated on the label. If you apply half of that, one milligram per square centimeter, then you'll get half that protection. Two milligrams per square centimeter converts to about a quarter teaspoon for your face. If you have less sunscreen on your skin, 
then you're going to have gaps in your protection. You'll have less sunscreen particles on your skin, which means that incoming UV is going to have a better chance of getting in between these particles and not get absorbed. So you can think of sunscreen as foundation to hide your skin from the sun. If you have less sunscreen, you'll have patchy coverage and it's more likely that the sun can see your skin. If you have more sunscreen, then it's more likely that you have even coverage and you've got everything covered up from the sun's UV. Myth number three, we don't need sunscreen because we evolved to live with the sun. There are two big things wrong with this. Firstly, we don't live where we evolved. Most Americans and most Australians have lighter skin than the people that evolved to live there. Even if you're living in a place where your skin color evolved, there are lots of different conditions in our modern world. Firstly, people didn't used to go on beach holidays where they laid in the sun for hours. This sort of intermittent intense UV where you get sunburn once or twice a year on holiday is actually linked to deadlier skin cancers like melanoma. Melanoma has steadily increased over the last 50 years. In Norway, there's 11 times more melanoma in 2019 than in 1953. People also like tanning these days because a tan is seen as healthy and so people are more likely to go out and seek sun exposure. The environmental conditions these days are also different. So here's story time with Michelle. Thomas Midgley Jr. is the unluckiest scientist who's ever lived. He invented CFCs. These are super stable chemicals that are non-toxic and they're fantastic for fridges, aerosols, air conditioners. You can breathe it and you can drink it and it is completely safe. The problem is they're so stable that they can last for decades and so they slowly migrate their way up through the atmosphere into the stratosphere which is where our ozone layer is. It is a really thin layer but it is absolutely vital for protecting us from UV. So in 1985 scientists discovered the ozone hole which is an area over the South Pole with very thin ozone. And so in 1987 the Montreal Protocol was enacted. This got everyone in the world to stop using CFCs. But the damage that was done is still recovering, it still hasn't recovered yet. There's also more nitrous oxide from agriculture these days which also thins ozone. And so in general we have less ozone in the world and therefore more UV. So the ozone hole over Antarctica is big enough to affect some parts of the world like Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Chile and Argentina. And so we didn't evolve with mass migration, beach holidays or thinned ozone, we need sunscreen. Myth number four, sunscreens cause coral reef bleaching. There is no good evidence that this is happening. Where this comes from is misinterpretation of research, governments jumping on this as a way of avoiding dealing with tricky issues, and skincare companies jumping on this as a marketing opportunity for their so-called reef safe sunscreens. And this isn't just something that people who like skincare, dermatologists are saying, it's something that coral scientists who have been studying coral their whole lives are saying. I quoted some coral scientists in my video on coral reefs and sunscreen. Here are some more quotes from a more recent opinion piece from some coral researchers, including the lead researcher of a recent study that went out and measured sunscreen concentrations in lots of places in Hawaii. I've linked this piece in the description and I recommend reading it because it's a really good summary of the whole coral sunscreen thing. We're perplexed by the misguided distraction that a limited and unreplicated study about one of the sunscreen chemicals, oxybenzone, is gaining. And we're frustrated that it's taking the spotlight of scientifically proven concerns to reef decline. People are being led to believe there is extensive scientific evidence about the impact of oxybenzone on corals, and this is simply not true. So there are a bunch of studies where scientists put coral into high concentrations of sunscreen ingredients and the corals bleached. But you need a high enough concentration to have a negative effect. This is sometimes called the dose makes the poison. If you eat two atoms of arsenic, nothing happens. So unless coral is getting a high enough concentration of sunscreen, then it won't be affected. So scientists have been measuring the amounts of sunscreen around coral reefs, and in all of the studies except for that one unreplicated study, the concentrations have been too low to have an effect. So we're talking hundreds or thousands of times lower than you need. Since my last video on coral reefs and sunscreens, there's been more studies doing this, and again, the concentrations are still around the same. They're still too low. Currently, the limited scientific evidence for Hawaii and Florida does not show that sunscreen chemical components exist at concentrations that harm corals. There's also no real world evidence of sunscreen harming coral. If sunscreen were a cause of coral die-offs, we would expect to see reef damage where sunscreen concentrations are highest, but there is no data to support that. In fact, the Australian government found the majority of recent coral bleaching occurred where there is low to no human interaction, and that coral is actually healthier in tourist-heavy, high-traffic areas. 
The only published evidence for sunscreens harming coral is where some researchers said that they saw more coral damage where tourists were. The problem with this is that anecdotal evidence isn't good evidence for causation, as I explained in my anecdotal evidence video. There are a million things that could explain this observation. People might be trampling the coral, people also go there because it might be closer to civilization, which means it's closer to things like sewage, which have been linked to coral damage. That's why we need studies to show us that there's a likely link between sunscreens and coral damage, and this just isn't happening. The biggest factors contributing to coral reef damage according to coral scientists are climate change, biological imbalances from things like overfishing, and runoff from land-based pollution. There's loads of evidence for this. Studies in labs, studies in the environment, not just a couple of lab studies like there is for sunscreen. Then why are places like Hawaii focusing on the thing with the flimsiest evidence and not the things that coral scientists have been pointing out for decades? It's because government policy isn't always based on good science. There are tons of examples of this, so the war on drugs, the choice to give Australians bad internet, but these bigger problems, climate change, overfishing and land pollution, are really hard for governments to fix. There are huge industry interests at stake. And on an individual level, tourism is usually a big income maker for places with coral reefs. The government's not going to tell you to stop going there. It's much easier to tell people the convenient lie that if you just use the right sunscreen, then it's fine. Even though air travel is one of the biggest contributions to your environmental footprint. And as a consumer, this is a really nice feel-good idea, and so of course, skincare companies are going to take advantage of that in their marketing. While it's enticing to think that an urgent problem like coral reef decline could be impacted by something as easy as choosing a different sunscreen, the reality is not so simple. If you want to do something much more meaningful to help save coral reefs, the coral scientists suggest this. Instead of purchasing a reef-safe sunscreen, a marketing claim that is not regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, consumers can eliminate their use of fertilizers. Government leaders can push for better wastewater solutions and invest in renewable energy, in addition to funding environmental research, protection and restoration. Energy spent trying to enact ineffectual solutions may be well-intentioned, but it's wasted and damaging. Let's not waste more time and money fighting the right problem with the wrong solution. Myth number five. Moisturizer with SPF doesn't work as well as sunscreen. If a product is labeled with an SPF, then the words sunscreen and moisturizer don't really have different legal meanings. Both types of products are tested with the same methods, provided they have the same regulated labels. These are SPF, the regulated UVA rating, so whether that's broad spectrum, the UVA logo, the Boots star rating, or the PA or PPD rating, and the water resistance label. In different parts of the world, you'll also have different types of regulations. So in Australia, for example, they're both regulated as listed therapeutic products, which means they'll both have an OSTL registration number. In the US, both are regulated as drugs, so they'll have a drug facts label. The names are just marketing, it doesn't really matter, there's a lot of overlap between the two categories. So sunscreens that aren't marketed as moisturizers usually have moisturizing ingredients as well. Some people say that it's easier to apply the right amount of sunscreen compared to applying the right amount of moisturizer, but I disagree. From the sunscreens and moisturizers I've tried on the market, I don't think there's any sort of consistent trend there. There is a study where people applied less of an SPF moisturizer than a sunscreen, but they only used one single moisturizer and one single sunscreen. The study is misleadingly called Application of SPF Moisturizers is Inferior to Sunscreens and Coverage of Facial and Eyelid Regions. I don't think the study actually shows what the title says. Myth number six, you need to avoid alcohol in sunscreens. Alcohol is an ingredient that has a lot of myths around it in skincare, that it's pro-aging and inflammatory, that it's irritating, that it'll dry out your skin. I talked about the science behind alcohol in skincare in my collaboration with Kind of Steven, which I've linked in the description. We looked at a bunch of studies where really high concentrations of alcohol, so 60-80% alcohol, was applied to skin 25, 50, 100 times a day, way more exposure than we get in skincare. They found that even in these really extreme conditions, there wasn't a significant amount of inflammation or irritation. Even for skin dehydration, there were mixed results, so skin wasn't always more dehydrated if they treated it with tons of alcohol compared to treating it with tons of water. With sunscreens, you only really have 5-10% to alcohol and you're not applying it 100 times a day, and so you wouldn't expect there to be much inflammation or irritation. If you're worried about dryness, there's a study that found that humectants are made up for the effects of drying alcohol, and so just look for humectants in your sunscreen. So if there's a sunscreen that you love, but the only thing that's holding you back from using it is the word alcohol on the label, then it's probably fine to keep using it. I hope you liked this video. Let me know in the comments if there's a myth that you'd like to see me bust. 
If you like this video, drop me a like and click the subscribe. This video is here thanks to Skillshare. If you like educational videos like mine, but with better production quality, then it's definitely worth checking out. Skillshare is an online community with a massive range of classes on creative topics like photography, design, video editing, time management, cooking, and even picking houseplants. Most of the classes are under an hour, so even if you have a tight schedule, you can fit a bit of creativity into your day. One class that I really, really loved is Tabitha Park's DIY Backdrops, Dynamic Surfaces for Tabletop Photography. I was in a bit of a photography rut with my product images, and this class really inspired me to take some more visually interesting photos with cheap materials that I already had on hand, but I just didn't really know how to use them well. They're always launching interesting new premium classes, and with an annual subscription, it's less than $10 a month. If you want to see what it's all about and get creative, then the first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a two month free trial of the premium membership. So that's it from me. You can also check out my Instagram and my blog if you like more beauty science and I'll see you next time.